me. Appreciate that. Doing okay today? Going from 80 degrees to shoveling tomorrow. <clears throat> Such is life. By the way, if you're joining us online, they're going to have, we are going to have communion together at the end of this service. So if you do not have elements, uh, go ahead and gather those. And I'm looking up to our camera people. I was told that I have, we're down a camera person, so I have to remain. <laughs> You're laughing. You're laughing. You've been here before. Maybe I've caged myself in. That'll help me not to move. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll stay in this box. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I want to give a shout out to uh, Rick Bovell. Rick, where are you? Why don't you stand up, Rick? Why don't you stand up, stand up, stand up. Rick is uh, one of the gifts of God that he has brought to us. He is an ordained pastor. He's a Bible teacher. He uh, has worked in ministry off and on a lot in his life. And so the Lord is uh, gifting him to us, and he is teaching a class on the book of Ephesians uh, starting today. So they had a class, but there's going to be 15 classes. And so I would encourage you to come here at 9 a.m. There's two things primarily happening. One's a prayer meeting that uh, you are all welcome to be a part of. Second is this class in the book of Ephesians. So Rick's a good man, a great Bible teacher. And so if you say, hey, I want to grow in my faith, that's a good way to do that. So thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> Also, if you have not heard, um, uh, a good friend to this congregation and a, <laughs> a good friend of Jesus's uh, went home to be uh, with the Lord this week. That is uh, Larry Smith. Larry uh, sits there typically every, every, um, every Sunday for 61 years, a part of this congregation. And uh, he went home to be with the Lord quicker than we anticipated um, yeah, I don't want to get into all of that because I'll start crying. Um, so you are invited to remember him, to honor him, to worship together as a, a congregation, group of people. Two opportunities um, today, visitation from three to five that's going to be happening uh, at Olson Funeral Home. And you can look him up online, get the... Get the um, Get the address for that. That's happening today, 3 to 5. Tomorrow, Monday, 4 o'clock, here in this room, uh, we will be um, um, giving him a home, homecoming celebration. A, a funeral is going to happen tomorrow at 4 o'clock. You are invited to participate in that. Uh, there will be testimonies of his life, many songs, and he was a godly and generous and gracious lover of Jesus his whole life, a man of prayer. Uh, the prayer room, by the way, which is over here, their family has given that a gift to us, and I told him the prayers would continue on, and his legacy will continue on. So his memorial service is happening tomorrow, 4 o'clock, and then afterwards there's going to be a meal. All right, well, as mentioned this morning, we are returning to our series called Life in His Name, in the Gospel of John. So if you have a Bible with you today, please open it up to John chapter 4, and we're going to pick up the story in verse 42. So today we will see Jesus traveling from a region in the south of Israel, Samaria, to, a region, to the region of Galilee, which is north of it. And in this place and in our passage today, we'll see Jesus encountering an official who had a very sick boy. And this is a short story, but you'll be surprised about how much is packed into it. So now, if you remember, John's, the apostle's reason for writing is that you and I may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This is uh, John 20, 31. That we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, uh, you may have life in his name. This is John's 
aim for writing this gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit to prove the identity of this man called Jesus, that indeed he is the Son of God, he is the Christ, and that we would believe in him, put our faith in him, and in so doing that we would receive life, life that is abundant, life that is eternal in his name. So this is what he focuses on. And my hope is that from the story today, that we would learn some important spiritual truth. That this passage will help us understand the different responses to Jesus, not just in his day, but in our day as well. That we'll learn the necessity of trusting in the word and see the pivot point, the hinge place that took this man from honoring Jesus to believing in Christ for his salvation. So this passage should, if we have ears to hear, help build our understanding of faith. And it should give you and I specific ways to pray for family, for loved ones, for acquaintances, for neighbors. Specific ways to pray for them so that they will move, the Holy Spirit will move on them so that they would put their faith in Christ. This passage day also gives us an opportunity to examine our own hearts. So let's pray again. Let's just pause to pray right now. So Father, what a privilege it is to worship you. What a privilege it is to gather together, to share in fellowship, to love one another, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another. What a privilege it is to gather around your word. And God, we have prayed, and I continue to pray, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would give us eyes to see, to hear your word, to see you working, hearts that will be open, that you indeed would continue to speak to us this morning. God, help me to communicate these things and say what is right about you and true about you. The work in this place, again, we ask. Thank you for your grace among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so here we are, John chapter 4, and we're going to pick the story up in verse 43. And you'll notice that our passage today is connected to the passage right before it, and I'm going to refer back to it here in the beginning, because John wants us to see a contrast to how Jesus was received in Samaria, and now how he is received in in Galilee. So it's important to see that connection. So let's start reading in verse 43 of John 4. After the two days, he departed for Galilee. For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. Okay, we're going to pause right there. This is the first main point, and I have three of them. (laughs) Honor the Lord Jesus. So like I said, our passage for today is set in contrast to the previous passage. They're connected with the sentence, after the two days, he departed to Galilee. So that means we have to ask ourselves, well, what happened in those two 
days. Well, in those two days, Jesus and his followers were in the region again of Samaria, just south, a region of mixed blood, of mixed faith, of limited understanding. They were there. And in that place, Jesus had an appointment, had an encounter with a woman at a well. Now, that passage ends with these words. And I want us to pay attention to a few things here. This is John 4. Just go up a little bit. John 4, 39. Okay? This is how it reads. It says, Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So they believed because of the words of this woman. She said, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. There's the two days. Verse 41. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now Jesus did not do any physical signs and wonders in Samaria. Now, he had a word of knowledge, so to to speak. He knew exactly everything about this woman and used that to draw her to him. And this woman then believed him, at least to be a prophet. And she ran back to town and shared her words, her testimony of this person named Jesus. And it says that these people, some people, believed. And these people, because of her testimony, then came out to hear this man, to hear the word of God to them. And then they believed. And then a great many did so because they wanted to hear The words of this man. Jesus' word convinced these people because their minds were open, their hearts were open, to indeed understand and believe what he said that brought them to the conclusion that he indeed was the Savior of the world. It was an outright Revival because of the words of Jesus. They honored him and placed their faith in him. It was a remarkable two days. Now it was time to return on his journey because he was coming from Jerusalem, just where he was, okay, traveling up north back to his homeland. He was raised in that section of Israel in Nazareth. He was returning back to that place. And there was a contrast, right? Jesus continued going north to his own people in the region he grew up in. Now, his reception in the region of Galilee, his own people, was far different than the reception he received from the Samaritans. He was not honored by the Galileans as he was honored by those in Samaria, those half-breeds. Now, why was this? Why was this different. What was the difference? You would think that these people, the Galileans, those who were Jewish, those who um, adopted and embraced all of the Old Testament scripture would have indeed embraced him, but that was not the case. Why? It's recorded Jesus teaching and saying, well, because 
a prophet, a man with, or a woman with the word of God, they have no honor in their own hometown. So that makes us ask the question, well, why does a prophet have no honor in their hometown? Well, the answer is because of familiarity. Right? They were familiar with him. They saw Jesus as not necessarily anyone special. Right? You can read more about this in Matthew 13, and they were saying things like, Wait a second, isn't that Jesus? Like, didn't he grow up like right around the corner? <laughs> isn't his mom Mary and isn't he the son, maybe, of the carpenter? His brothers and his sisters, <laughs> I did it, I just noticed myself. You knew it was going to happen. <laughs> okay, stay, Dave. Okay, his mothers and his sisters and his brothers are here among us. <laughs> Where did he get his wisdom? Where did he get his special knowledge? <laughs> they knew about Jesus, and they didn't honor him. There was some of this mentality of who does he think he is? He was familiar to them. Now, in thinking about that this week, I thought about our Western culture. And in many ways, here in America and in the West, people are familiar, familiar with Jesus. They may have heard about him from their grandmother, perhaps about their parents. Christmas time, right? We've seen on the lawn <laughs> Often next to Santa Claus, the manger, Jesus, Mary, the baby. We have songs that sing about this Christ child. And most people, almost all people, know something about Jesus. Oh yeah, that's Jesus, Mary, Joseph, donkey, angels. Okay, I'm going to get my latte at Starbucks. Right? We've become familiar with the story, familiar with the character. I think even around my neighborhood, and we've been praying for my neighborhood for five years, six years, as long as we have been living there, I've had conversations, and people are familiar with Jesus, but they haven't move to honor him. This is our society. Where Jesus is welcomed, but he is not honored, right? We saw this in the passage where the Galileans welcomed him. And Jesus said a prophet is not honored in his hometown. Welcomed, but not honored. And they welcomed him because they too were in Jerusalem. And if you go back in John, you'll see that Jesus did signs and wonders while he was there in Jerusalem. Obviously, a healing, or this man we're going to run into in just a moment, wouldn't have asked him up to heal his son. He did some things there. These Galileans were there, and they're saying, wow, this guy can do some stuff, right? And so they said, well, they welcomed him because they wanted Jesus to do the stuff there as well. And I found this very true, especially here in America, that people will welcome Jesus as long as he does some stuff for them, right? Heal my daughter. Bless my finances. Help me to be calm. We, wel they, we are... American society and society perhaps in Christianized places, they'll welcome Jesus as long as he does things for them. But he's not honored as the Savior. 
of the world. We will welcome him for what we can get from him, but we will not honor him for who he is. They, people who are familiar, they see Jesus as a means to an end, a way to get something, but not as an end in himself. Honoring Jesus for who he is and serving him and following him and treasuring him. Treasuring him is miles apart from welcoming him because he might get you something that you want. I've seen it. You've seen it. Our society is full of people who think this way concerning Jesus. They'll welcome him if they give him what they want, but they won't follow him. They won't serve him. They won't recognize him for the Savior of the world. (laughs) And they'll turn their backs on him if he doesn't deliver what they demand of him. Does this sound familiar to anybody? I've seen it. I'm not following Jesus because I prayed and he did not heal my grandmother the way that I wanted to fully on Jesus. You and I know that story. Now I have to ask us in this room, listening online, either now or in the future, Do you just welcome Jesus for what he can do for you? Or do you honor and love him for who he is? I want you to think about that. Do you just want stuff? From Jesus? Or do you want Jesus? Is it, I have a health need, fix it? Or is it, I have a sin need, forgive me, change me, give me the power to live for you? Do you use Jesus to get what you want? Or do you love Jesus and give him what he wants? Do you go to Christ for how he can serve you? Or do you go to Christ for how you can serve him? Here's a strong statement. Unbelievers use God. Believers love God. This thought is drawn out from this text, right, in the opening encounter, right, in the opening comparison. The Samaritans believed the word of God. They didn't need signs. They didn't need wonders. They didn't need packages from God. They didn't need any of that. They believed what he said because he said it. And they put faith in him because of the word of God. And in contrast, those who now become familiar, they they just welcome him because they wanted to see the stuff, right? Not honoring him for who he was. This is the background. This is the setup to this encounter. Now, let's pay attention to what Jesus does next. How he tells the truth and moves this man, this person, into saving faith. This is John chapter 4, picking up the story again in verse 46. So he came again to Cana in Galilee. We've heard of this place before. If you're paying attention to John, this is the place, the very town which... Jesus performed his first sign in turning water into wine. 
And that Capernaum, that was a town about 16 and a half miles away, there was an official who worked, according to the Greek, in the for Herod, okay, a royal official, a man of wealth and means and access, who had probably everything he wanted, but the one thing he desired most at this point, because his little boy, his son, was very ill. Verse 47. Now, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea in the south by Jerusalem to Galilee, he went to see him. And he asked Jesus to come down and to heal his son. So news had spread that the gentle healer was here. For he was at the point, his son, of death hanging by a thread. Verse 48, so Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. That seems a little (laughs) off-putting. Seems a little rude, right? Here is this man who traveled 16 and a half miles, right? Who was desperate and in need. And Jesus says, well, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Jesus was getting not just at his felt need, the, the, the eminent death of his son, but his real need. That is for forgiveness of sin and new life that is eternal. Because unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Well, the official said to him, again, out of desperation, Sir, 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 come down before my child dies. Notice Jesus' response at this point. At this second persistent request, Jesus said to him, go. Your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And proving so, went on his way. First thing I've asked you to do is to think about, do you welcome Jesus or honor him? Second thing we must consider from this passage, do we trust in his word or trust in his word? Now Jesus and his followers are back in the town of Cana in the region of Galilee. Again, the place where he (coughs) performed and recorded... (coughs) The first miracle, excuse me, again, this was the first sign, right, display of his power that he had authority over creation. The first sign given to who he was. Now, of course, news got out that Jesus then was there, and this official in the royal house Again, out of his desperation came up. The truth is that people often reach out to God for help in desperate circumstances, right? When are the churches typically full? After a desperate situation. After a plane runs into the towers in New York. After there is a Shooting at a nearby place. When do people typically flock to God? When they are desperate. Now God does use this turning towards him to bring people to their greatest need to saving faith. And we'll see this here. Sometimes that is the greater purpose as to why difficult things happen. Because often we forget about God when things are good. And you can say, man, right? It's a story of Israel. 
It's the story of judges. When things, things were going good, they're like, awesome, we've got this. And then in time, it goes bad, and it goes really bad. And they're like, oh, we need help. And they cry out to God, and God delivers them. And around and around and around and around they went. Does this sound familiar? So here is this desperate situation. Here is this man moving towards Jesus. Looking for help because he ran into something that was bigger than him and beyond his control, just often like us. Why? Well, in these places we realize our need of God. We are stripped of our own self-reliance, our own education, our own pride, our own bank accounts, because these situations are beyond anything that we can go, and so these things Turn us through the truth of reality. And again, God does use these things. God will use these things and the measure of faith we have to move us to place our trust in Him for salvation. He is looking to move people from Seeking him for what he can give them to believing him by or at his word. This is why Jesus responded the way he did to this man who was desperate, to the man who traveled a long way. Notice that he said, go with me, go with me. Notice Jesus did not go with him physically, but sent his word ahead of him. He was moving this man from trusting in Jesus' abilities to trusting in Jesus' word. And he moves us the same way. Will you not just believe in what he has done through his miracles? And we'll see more through the resurrection, which we do have to pay attention to. All of these things point to his identity. But will we ultimately believe in the one who says that I am the Messiah? I am the Savior. I am the bread of life. I am the Lamb of God. This man had this opportunity going from desperation to believing his word. And he believed. So we have to again ask the question, do you trust the word of God? And do you know what it says is true? And do you trust yourself to it for what it says because if you honor Jesus you honor what he says makes me wonder sometimes have you become overly familiar with the word that you're like yeah I'll get to that it's good but I got Instagram to follow Makes me wonder a little bit, where does God's word, where, where is it in our heart? Where is it as a congregation? Have we talked about ever about reading the Bible in here before? Have we ever talked about that? Treasuring, honoring, coming to it as this is the one who gives and has the word of life. Honoring it as a special place in our mind, in our hearts, treasuring it because we treasure the one who gives it to us. Jesus gave him his word and this man chose to believe and trusted the words of Jesus proved by his actions. He went on his way. 
in America, again, we have Bibles galore, right? I have more Bibles on my iPhone right, than most of the world has access to. Right? And some regions have very little access. I remember hearing a story back when Bibles had to be smuggled into places. Like China. I remember reading this story where they smuggled in this um, suitcase full of Bibles and they were there um, trying to distribute them primarily to church leaders and congregations because people were gathering and didn't even have the scriptures. This man, I could just picture the scene in my mind, was with this group of people and he only had one scripture, one Bible left. And he started to rip off pages and give them one at a time to people. They wept having a page. The word of God. They were so hungry to know God, have his word. God, help us to have that hunger. Do you trust it? Do you treasure it? Do you read it as what it is, the very word of God? God, speak to us. Jesus gave this man an opportunity not to believe him because of performing a miracle, but will you believe because he said Do you believe that Jesus will come back because he says? Do you believe that there will be a resurrection of the dead because he says it? Do you believe that there will be an inheritance because he says it? Do you believe that there will be a judgment because he says it? Do you believe that he is the Son of God because he says it? This is moving from welcoming Jesus to honoring Jesus to then Thirdly, putting your trust in Jesus for salvation and your very life and your very eternity. So let's see what happens next in the rest of this story. This is John 4, starting with verse 51. So as this official then turned for the word of the Lord as he was going down back to his home in Capernaum, his servants, who were there in town, met him. So he was traveling their way, and he stayed overnight someplace, and they were coming to talk to him. His servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So this man asked them, tell me, when did this happen? Tell me the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, which is one o'clock, by the way, at one o'clock, at that moment, that's when the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour, the exact time when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed this is a different belief than a honoring of his word. He believed who Jesus was, put his faith in him, he and all his household, those who were connected to him. This was now the second sign that Jesus did. We had come from Judea to Galilee. Third point. We're going from We're going from honoring the Lord Jesus, trusting his word, belief, believe in his name. Third point. So again, this official and his entourage, those who were with him, were heading home. Servants were 
uh, at home were coming to meet him, and they met. And he told him his son was recovering. By the way, not all healings of God are instantaneous. Very quiet. Right? Sometimes, well, if God is moving, then I have to pray and they'll immediately get up. That is not always the case. Right? It says, your son is recovering. This was a pivot moment. This was a turning moment. It was from one thing, being dead, to now having the word of life becoming alive. And he was recovering, right? And this man then investigated, right? He didn't like, oh, he wasn't like, I'm so glad he's better. I got what I wanted, okay? This was beyond just welcoming Jesus. He was believing his word, saying, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. He wanted to verify what took place. Say, tell me exactly when there was a turning, when he went from death to life. And they said, well, at one o'clock. And he's like, Jesus made the difference. Jesus did that. There is an investigation of God's working. I believe the word, and now I see this evidence And when we pray for people and we're praying for things, and when you pray for things, don't just pray for the thing, but after something happens, look for the evidence of what happened and then give glory, right, to the one who had answered that prayer. So this man didn't just get what he wanted, he got what he truly needed And he believed in Jesus. It was not just welcoming him for what he could get. He trusted him. He believed in him. And he loved him. Committed his life to him. Committed to following him. Put his faith in him. And received life in Jesus' name. Sound familiar, John? Yes, it does. Why this is here. This was the point of salvation. It was the point of trust. It was the point of belief for both this man, his entire household, and many revival broke out. This is often how God works in people's lives. From hearing about him, to perhaps welcoming him, to honoring him, to trusting in his word, to giving their life to him. Does that sound familiar process? When you think about the people in your life, where are they in that process? Now, I've run into Samaritans, right? People who are ready to believe right now. I've had the privilege of leading people and introducing them to the Word of God, who is Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Savior of the world. Other times, because of familiarity, especially here in the West, perhaps in your school or your workplace or your neighbors, perhaps even your kids who perhaps grew up in this place are no longer following Jesus. They'll welcome him when they have a need, but they don't honor him. Does this sound familiar? Come on. right? How do you pray for them? Pray that they'll move from welcoming Christ to honoring Christ, to being familiar with his word, to believing in his word. And in so doing, seeing the Savior of the world and putting their faith in Him. The difference being, between being familiar with Jesus and following Jesus. Are you hearing me? Is He or is He not the Savior of the world? Is He or is He not the Word of God that John gloriously declares from the beginning in from the beginning of this gospel in the beginning was the word the word was god the word was god he was with god in the beginning and all things were created by him and for him and through him he is the light that broke out in the darkness is he god in the flesh or is he not because if he is you better pay attention He's not one among many. He is the one and only. 
No one like him. No one who is resurrected. No one who has the word of life. No one like him who was prophesied, who was proclaimed, who was received, resurrected, who was glorified, who gives us his promises. You and I have to figure out for ourselves who he is. Why Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? Because who he is matters. Jesus does not have only power over sickness and disease. He has authority. He's over it. He can tell it what to say. This is why this is the second sign. Not only is the God of creation, but he's God of everything. And when he speaks, things happen. Jesus didn't need to be physically present. All he needed to do is say the word. Boom. Changes. Why did John record this? Why did it write down? Why did the Holy Spirit direct him? So that we would see how people interact with Jesus. From Samaritans to Nicodemus to disciples to Pharisees. <laughs> to a royal official in desperation. And there are people just like this all over and at all times. Do you believe in his name? That's the point. So, let's reflect and we're going to move into communion. I'm asking you to think about what the Word has given us today. Now, perhaps the Holy Spirit has moved in your heart, shown you what is true about you. Don't miss that, right? The last thing I want to hear is, oh, that's a good sermon, and you leave it here in the room. I don't care about if you think it's a good sermon or not. I do care if you listen to the Word of God or not. I do care that you respond to the Holy Spirit or not. I care about that. My words, bleh. God's words, better pay attention. What is he saying? I to think about this. How is he moving you? God moves us. Now, perhaps after you've done that, you'll think, okay, this has given me some specific ways to pray for my kids, my grandkids, my neighbors, my school, school um, mates, my co-workers, whatever it is. Where are they at on this? Pray. Right? Pray for my family to go beyond from welcoming him, welcoming him to honoring him, to believing him. This is how I'm praying. Pray this way. It gives you some tools, some language, right? And perhaps today you want to move forward in your faith journey. Maybe you are ready today. I don't know. But if you are, take the step from believing in his word to believing in him. Right? Placing your faith in Jesus and convinced that he is the Son of God, the Christ, the Savior of the world. That by believing in him, you may have life in his name. Or that's, perhaps that's you. So I'm going to pray and we're going to transition to communion. Dan will lead us in that. So God, we do thank you um, on this uh, cold and stormy and perhaps snowy day. 
that we're thankful that your word is here with us. Spirit is here with us. Still call people to yourself. Jesus, as we turn in a moment to remember you, God, may this not just be familiar to us. We do it like a lot. Help us to honor, esteem you. God, I pray for the person or persons who are hearing me now in this room or hearing this 10 years from now online. They would investigate and see who you are. They would read your word. Let you move on their hearts. Be welcome to honor, trust, believe. Make yourself clear, plain, and visible. For those, perhaps, someone here today says, today is the day. May today be the day of their salvation, where they, their faith, will follow you. Lead, guide, bless, fill us again. In Jesus' name.